Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate Child and Youth Mental Health Day. My name is Victoria Kettis and I'm part of the Family Smart staff team. We want to first start by acknowledging that we gather today on the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Musqueam, Stamanus, and Stalo people, and we give gratitude for their hospitality. Since 2007, Family Smart has been inviting children, youth, and families, and other caring adults across Canada to talk about how important caring connected relationships are to and those relationships are to our mental health. So thank you for coming online today to connect and to celebrate May 7th. So as we join together, um, we are going to be having space for you to write some comments in below. We'd love for you to join in the conversation. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce Liz Kay. She is in the counseling field now since 2008. Liz works at Three Story Clinic in Heartwood Concurrent Disorders Treatment Program and is a wonderful human being. So welcome, Liz, and uh, happy May 7th. Amazing. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, it's truly a privilege to be here today with all of you who are watching um, and with the Family Smart staff. Um, my hope for these next 45 minutes are um, really to bring kind of a sense of calm, um, maybe to bring some validation, um, and also to spark ideas as we are kind of individually and collectively navigating um, how to care for our mental health. Oh, we can all benefit from all of those things. So thank you. Um, I just want to remind people really quick that as they're leaving comments, there may be specific questions they have for you or want to engage with, but we won't be answering specific questions today. We would love for you to, however, connect in with your PIR if you do have specific questions and you can reach them and find out about more about our Family Smart Parent and Residence on our website at familysmart.ca. So I leave it with you, um, Liz, and thank you. Amazing. So you all may find that this conversation that we're going to be having um, is particularly important right now as we're navigating um, strange and sometimes challenging times. Um, you may also find that uh, some of these ideas might be relevant um, as you uh, look back at your life and some of the challenges that you've had back then. Um, and I know that Victoria mentioned that this is interactive, but I want to reiterate that again. Um, I'm a uh, facilitator who loves the comments, loves ideas, and really want this to be collaborative because I know how much wisdom there is out there. Um, so hop on your devices, um, comment, we'll ha have questions for you, because um, I really think that the richness comes from all of us. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, the first couple minutes, I would really like to spend just on kind of how to start settling our bodies. Um, some of you might have been feeling um, more pressure, more stress, more anxiety nowadays. Um, I know I have. Um, and so to start, I really want to just um, honor kind of what we're feeling and help settle us in by starting with a guided meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, meditation and mindfulness practices can help prime our brain for learning and engaging and collaborating. Um, so without further ado, I'd like you to find a spot to settle in, get comfy in your chairs. Um, this will be an investment in kind of the next 45 minutes so that you can be grounded, present, and um, really contributing uh, to a really meaningful dialogue. Okay. Um, so this is a gratitude meditation. So you've got a comfortable spot where you're sitting and I want you to draw your attention to your breath. With a few deep breaths in and out. Letting your chest rise and fall with each inhalation and exhalation. And when you're ready, let your eyes drift close or find a comfortable spot to rest your gaze. And as you continue to breathe slowly and deeply, 
Let your attention rest gently on your breath. Feeling the movement as it enters and exits your body. Each time you exhale, let go of any tension. Relax your face, your shoulders, your belly, your legs. And on your next exhale, settle your attention to the area around your heart. Focus on the feelings of love, compassion, empathy, and forgiveness. And with your attention on your heart, bring to mind something or someone that you are grateful for. Notice how you have felt supported. And as you continue with your easy, relaxed breathing, perhaps it's gratitude for being alive or healthy. Perhaps you are grateful for the sunshine or your home. Perhaps you are grateful for your colleagues, neighbors, or frontline workers making the choice to continue to care for people during difficult times. Bring your attention to people who truly nourish you in your life and how they bless you with their presence. Feel gratitude for your own life and the many gifts you have been blessed with. Now bring your attention to how this gratitude feels in the area around your heart. With each inhale, let this feeling grow. Let it grow outward, expanding to fill your chest, your arms, your hands, your legs, and your feet. With each inhale, this feeling grows, filling you up. And now, even as you return your attention to your breath, let your body remember the sensations of gratitude. I invite you all to come back to the room. Thank you. And hopefully you're feeling a little more kind of settled um, and you've been able to kind of ground yourself and truly be present uh, today. And if I'm just playing in the background, that's okay too. <laughs> um, we've all got different things and different challenges that we're facing. Um, so now that we're feeling a little bit more settled, we wanna check in on how you're doing. And I'm gonna ask you again and to search kind of deep inside you and think, how am I really doing? You might be feeling Frustrated, anxious, worried. You might still have that lingering gratitude or compassion. Maybe you're having a bit of a roller coaster. I know that I have over these past couple of months. My emotions have been kind of wild and all over the place. Um, the reason why I'm getting you to focus on how you're feeling is because when we know what our emotions are, 
we know how to nourish them. So really being mindful and spending the time to sit with how we're doing is so important. Mm. I think most of us right now can really relate to that feeling of loss at this moment. So I'm wanting to invite everyone out there who's joined us today to share what you might be missing and what you might feel is, is a loss right now, thinking of your children as well. So it could be the loss of connecting with friends or maybe it's that school program that you were looking forward to or going to the park. Um, we want to hear from you. So please feel free to jump in and share those comments of the things that um, you're feeling lost around right now at this moment. Yeah, so I'm getting lots of comments that it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster for folks. Mm -hmm. So really kind of grappling with the ups and downs of all the kind of waves of different feelings, um, which really ties in to this feeling um, of loss and kind of how grief can become uh, a real presence. Um, I'm, I'm looking at one of the feeds, so the presence of grandparents in my kids' lives that's such a such a loss. Um, oh, for nice. myself, I know it was the the um, loss of tradition, kind of around Easter time, kind of those big family meals where you all gather and get together. So that was a loss for um, kind of myself. Um, some of the other losses are around kind of uh, graduation and planning of big events that maybe aren't going to happen in the same way or the same idea that you had imagined in your head. Mm -hmm. so lots of loss coming up for folks. Um, and the loss of togetherness, thank you, Sharon. Um, and the confidence of knowing life as I knew. So the loss of what was normal and structured and routined. Amazing. Thank you for all the feedback. Um, and how about for your kids? What have they lost? What are some of the things that come up as um, uh, challenges for them? Maybe it's team sports. Maybe it's camps. Maybe it's, I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old and my six-year-old just like loves tackling and hugging and kissing her friends. And so that is a huge loss, that touch and connection. Um, so missing the classroom structure, yeah, and missing friends. So all these losses, the loss of independence for teenagers. Wow, I knew that the collective wisdom would come out. <laughs> um, just so many um, losses. Um, and I think uh, Brené Brown said, our normal has been lost physical connection, routine, traditions, gatherings. We don't have enough time to count the losses that we're experiencing. We don't have the awareness of all that we've lost. I don't know about you, but when I can understand my irritation and my bitterness and my mood swings and the ups and downs and the, the roller coasters, um, I start having more compassion towards myself. And I start having more compassion towards my kids and the behaviors that we're all exhibiting. So we're gonna shift from this awareness of the loss into how we can observe it. Because sometimes we don't even notice what's going on. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, grief. And I'm gonna name it as grief. And why do I name it? It's because if you don't name it, it's really hard to address. Um, so when we name an emotion, then we have more information on how to handle and manage it. So if I can name sadness, what I need is comfort. What I need is connection. If I'm feeling fear or scared, then I need reassurance. I needed to be reminded of all the strength that I've got and what I have overcome in the past. Um, I need to talk to people. I need to connect with people in whatever way I can in that moment so that my fear dissipates and I feel like I'm there alongside with someone who's supporting me. 
what happens when we don't start to address some of the loss and sadness and grief that we might be experiencing is that we start to kind of invalidate our experiences. We start to bury the emotions, um, which leads to shame. Those thoughts, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm seeing all of these people um, doing the perfect homeschooling and baking and holding down a full-time job and their life looks perfect and I'm not good enough. So we go to the spot of comparing um, and internalizing some of the feelings um, as shame. Um, when we bring those emotions to light, that's when we start healing. And that's where that compassion grows. And that's where that strength and that connection to other people, we start tying other people into our lives again. Mm. So back to you guys now, now's when we observe. Mm. So notice how it's affected you. Maybe it's through tearfulness. Maybe you're feeling more scattered, more kind of disorganized, more confused. Maybe you're just feeling a little foggy in general. Um, maybe you've noticed it in behaviors. Maybe you've noticed um, that you're drinking more or eating more. We all have different ways of coping with loss and coping with stress. Some healthy, others less so. Um, I want you to really take a minute and observe what you notice in yourself. Mm, thank you. I, I love the time to reflect and think about those things. And, and as I think about it in me, I also then think about it in my kids and, and how important it was to reflect on why my children might have been doing the things they were doing. So I'm wondering out there um, to all of you giving comments, what are the things that you've noticed in your kids that might be related to loss? What are the things you're seeing that are different that um, might give us a little bit more compassion and empathy, as you say, around these things, and we can notice why they, those things that they may be doing, and that they're attached to loss and to some of that grief that you've referred to. So um, please feel free to share your comments as we uh, continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. I can share just while we're waiting for some of the comments to come in. Um, I noticed in my kids, um, them being extra attached. <laughs> so sometimes they have trouble kind of peeling them off of me at times because um, they want to be so close. Um, I've got a comment from Jen here who uh, has noticed kind of feelings of loneliness in her kid and being really easily triggered. So having that reaction set in. Um, and uh, I think a lot of us have felt that as well. <laughs> um, not just our kids, but us as parents that kind of more quick to kind of react. Another burst of anger. Yeah, That's just right. left, right and center. Um, so maybe it's also kind of bad dreams the kids are having at a younger age or um, withdrawing. Um, so I see a comment here about kind of really kind of retreating and, and depression. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that's one comment I see too, just that things that you thought you had dealt with with your child that you'd gotten to the other side and now they're back at the beginning again. So um, those, Shannon expresses that idea of things that they thought were long overcome that are now coming up. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So the um, kind of feeling like you have to start again and, and yeah. really, um, focus your energy on kind of going back to those basics. Yeah. yeah. So all those successes are another loss that we're experiencing. All those successes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, so lots of people noticing like the normal rules are being pushed against and really hard. And I noticed that in, in my family as well. Um, extra sensitivity um, and extra need for attention amongst our kids. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it is about this distraction or feeling uh, like they are kind of lost and don't have the same amount of concentration maybe that they had before. Um, tears, you guys have brilliant comments. I love it. Um, 
And so a lot of stuff that pops up around kind of this idea of loss and grief and the behaviors that are associated with it. Um, and so when you see your kid being quick to anger, when you see the irritation, the um, sensitivity, um, maybe we can shift our frame and kind of use a different lens to see it, recognizing that that loss is real um, and they're experiencing real difficulties, just like kind of other, just like us all. Um, so we focused on our awareness. We focused on kind of what we're observing. And I don't want to leave you there because I feel like I'm not giving you a whole lot of hope at this point. So I'm not going to leave you in the depths of despair. Um, this next shift is what we can do about it and how to gain strength and how to come up with a plan that makes you feel stronger, more resilient. Um, and uh, because I know we're not at 100% capacity right now. None of us are our optimal selves at the moment. And I don't even know if 100% even exists for me, <laughs> probably because we're all not robots. Um, but regardless to say, none of us are at our best. Um, and when this happens, we need to start implementing other strategies. Um, we need to start kind of reframing the way we're doing things. Um, so I'm going to share with you a personal experience um, that I had with my husband um, a probably about a month ago. Um, and uh, I had just finished a really long day of work. My work days tend to be pretty long um, these days. Um, and I felt just utterly depleted, just like really heavy um, when I got home. And I went and I sat on my couch. And my husband came and he's like, hey, how's it going? And um, I was like, oh, like, I just feel really, really heavy. I feel really like low. I think it was on one of these like roller coaster waves that I was on and I had kind of hit the bottom <laughs> of, the, of the roller coaster and just felt this heaviness. And um, I like to think that over the years, I've trained my husband <laughs> to respond in the way that I need. Um, so he comes up to me and, and he just says, oh, yeah, it's really, really tough. Um, and he just sits there, not saying anything for a while. And then he said to me, Liz, why don't you take the far side of the bed tonight? And the translation, <laughs> you'll have no idea what that means. The translation was that I didn't have to wake up if our kids woke up in the night and I got to sleep in. Mm. And that was beautiful. That's all I needed to kind of feel supported and feel kind of lifted up. Um, so sometimes as families, um, we can support each other like that. And in those moments, it's beautiful. But sometimes we're both running on empty. And sometimes I'm at 20% capacity and he's at 30% capacity and we just need something more. Mm -hmm. When I think of families, families operate in a, in a very similar way. Sometimes everyone's on board to support. Times like this, I'm finding that everyone is feeling a little bit um, run down. And so times like this is when we maybe want to start thinking about what more can I implement? Um, so Brené Brown talks about this family gap plan. And if you guys have not listened to her podcast, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not going to do it justice, but I will give you a snapshot and then go listen to her because she's just, she's just wonderful. Um, so she talks about this family gap plan um, on what do we do when everyone's running low? So if I'm at 20%, my six-year-old is at 60%, my four-year-old's at 20%, we need 
to get up to like a, a functioning capacity so that we can hold it together. So when this plan, this happens, here's where you implement the family gap plan. The first step is to, just in life in general, try to have a space to open up communication. So perhaps that's kind of a check-in as someone comes in through the door, perhaps it's at dinner time, perhaps it's when we notice things are off, saying, hey, just wanna check in, how are you doing? Um, some people like using percentages other people like using um, colors. So I know the zones of regulation is big on colors. So I'll be like, oh my God, mama's, at, mama's in a uh, yellow, I'm virgin on red. <laughs> Meaning like I'm really close to like being angry or like I'm just at the edge of kind of, um, of not feeling like I can cope. Um, so come up with whatever language works for you. Um, so that you open up communication for that check-in time. Once you have kind of established that you're all running on empty, here's where the family gap plan comes in. Um, and the step one is to hunker down and go back to basics. So this means um, sleep, restore sleep. If you can get eight hours per night, amazing. If not, do the best you can to get as much sleep as possible. Um, this means that my diet of chocolate and nachos and popcorn needs to go out the window because I know that the sugar highs and lows that come with eating like that um, just wreak havoc on one's mental state. I know that. I still do it, but I, <laughs> I know it. So it's going back to the basics in all seriousness. That means choosing healthier food options, minimizing drinking, substance use, whatever people partake in, um, limiting news because we know that adds fuel to the fire. So use it when necessary um, and move. So this one is hugely important um, because we hold all our emotions in our body as well as our minds. So if you can move, then you start releasing, um, you start kind of processing things in a different way. So move. So that's step one to go back to basics. Um, then develop your own little um, unique family guide. So I'll give you an example and I brought it, um, it's been on my fridge for probably about six months. Um, a plan that my family has come up with. You can see my daughter's little pictures at the bottom. <laughs> she drew on it, the family. Um, so step one, breathe. Step two, no bossing. Explain everything. No angry voices. So this is, that came from my daughter. Um, instead, use the, the language, this is serious. Um, Everybody needs their own quiet time. Everyone needs to decompress at times um, and play music. Um, so everyone's gonna have their own different family gap plan that you, that you can implement when things get tough. So when you, everyone's running on empty, you'll be like, okay, this is the time. We gotta start implementing that plan. We gotta be doing things differently. A big one for others, I know, is um, gratitude. So acknowledge what other people are doing. Sometimes people find that it's kind of that one shift really makes a difference. Um, so after this, you can jot down a few notes for yourself. What do you want in your family gap plan? Um, and approach it with your family when they're in a good headspace. So number one rule of uh, kind of opening up a conversation like this, don't do it when people are, are kind of in fits of anger or irritability. Find the right time to have the conversation about what this plan is gonna look like. Yeah, that plan would look very different if it was when you're angry. <laughs> I love the love your plan has. <laughs> totally. Um, 
So we've heard uh, kind of Brené Brown's take on adding support and structure within a relationship during times of stress. These concepts of structure and control and predictability um, are also really important in navigating kind of any stressful life event. So I wanna share with you the definition of trauma because I think that this could be important. Um, the definition of trauma is that of any event um, that overwhelms our capacity to cope. So for some, major life events like what we're all experiencing right now may be producing huge anxiety and may be making us feel hugely overwhelmed. And it might at times feel like it's overwhelming our capacity to cope. Um, what we're living through right now is not only going to hit the history books, but we're going to remember it. Um, and when we perceive a lack of control, it makes it that much harder to process and cope. Lack of control is central into how trauma is experienced. Yet we know life is really unpredictable. And the reality is, is that there's sometimes or quite often situations that we can't control, mm -hmm. whether it be health, whether it be um, a car crash, job restructuring, or a pandemic. Um, and when this happens, we turn back to where can I focus my, on where can I refocus on what I can control? So cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy look to structure. They look to scheduling pleasant activities, creating routines to help build autonomy and predictability. And for some, this is kind of militant, and it means like it's seven o'clock in the morning, you wake up, you have breakfast, you do your exercise routine at this time, you schedule your Zoom call meeting in at this time, and it has to feel really structured. For others, that would make your skin crawl. <laughs> so um, in terms of uh, kind of focusing your attention on what you control, you'll do what works for you. And sometimes it also means um, uh, building mastery. So creating things, um, learning a new skill, playing the ukulele, teaching yourself mm -hmm. the ukulele. So new things where we can kind of exert control and influence things. Yes, and I love to see the things that are coming out of people that are being so creative. And we're seeing that at seven o'clock in the evenings, the way that people are, are finding ways to create something that is a ritual for themselves. So in thinking of you asking earlier about collective wisdom that we have on, on our uh, time together today, wondering to all of you, how do you create routine or some predictability or structure? And if structure is too big of a word and doesn't fit for you in your household, as it doesn't for many, um, perhaps you have daily or weekly rituals that help create safety and predictability for you and your family. So what are some of those things that you're doing to create some of that in order to help calm and have some control over some things in your life? Mm -hmm. I'm remembering back to a comment that um, I um, heard a couple of weeks ago now and that the, the way that this person got kind of the sense of control was over every morning making her bed. <laughs> and I loved how just such a simple act can focus back to kind of where we can get a sense of control. I love getting into a made bed. What about you guys on the call? Any thoughts? Yeah, so Jen, Jen's got a comment here um, around keeping family routines the same, but also leaving room for spontaneity. So creating that um, uh, kind of more flexible uh, mm -hmm. environment. So she mentions camping in the back garden, a family movie night with dinner in the living room. So adding in within the structure, adding in fun and um, memorable activities, amazing. Um, yeah, and, and scheduling in kind of that 
activity time, Shannon's uh, kind of suggesting. Um, and I need to make my bed. So other people are on the same boat, kind of this need for um, their environment to feel comfortable feels like it's a big one for folks. Um, the routine of sitting with your coffee in a quiet location and running with your dog. So having that time just for you um, to find peace and calm. Yeah, amazing. Stephanie, I love that um, you're finding that it's not working for you to have structure, but that if you do the one thing first thing in the morning, at least that has happened and gives you a sense of control. So thank you for sharing that, Stephanie. Yeah, amazing. Um, so what we've explored today together, we've explored gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of through your own internal experience on what um, you're grateful for. We've um, explored bringing in awareness to our emotions and letting them come up rather than pushing them down really letting them come up in order to um, see what they need and nourish them. Um, we focused on loss um, and how that looks and how that explains some of the behaviors that we're seeing in ourselves and in our loved ones. Um, or just it explains kind of the behavior of people on the street <laughs> that you might be passing by. Um, and we've explored um, kind of how to shift things a little bit. So opening up communication, creating an additional plan, um, and then how to regain a sense of control when things sometimes fe feel pretty out of control. Um, so those are the snapshots of what we've covered today. Um, and if anyone has any additional comments or questions, Kind of now is now is the time to open up the floor. Mm. So what some of the things I heard is as uh, and, and read as we were going through is as Taryn said, no matter how much you fill the bucket, it's never full. It's like it always has a hole in it. So I wish you all time to fill your own buckets um, as you take on so many new roles in this work. Uh, time, whether you're being a parent and having to then be a teacher um, and working through all of that. So as you take the time to fill your own bucket so that you can give that extra attention to the leaky ones in your life. Um, Stephanie, I'm sorry that your child missed out on a big performance she probably worked very hard for. And uh, I, I'm grateful to you, Liz, for bringing up the uncomfortable parts too, where we talk about loss and grief and it's not... Um, all easy right now. Some people are, are still continuing to struggle where others are loving not having to go to school each day. But um, it's nice to know that there's some skills we can pull on, that there's some gratitude we can feel and go back to in our hearts, and that we can try and set up some of those things to make things a little easier in our days ahead. So thank you for your wisdom. I'm going to give you a last minute to kind of um, check into some of those comments that you had asked for, and uh, thank you for your wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you all for kind of such a rich dialogue. Um, it's a neat format of being able to, um, to hear from people who um, may be kind of across the, across the country. Um, if you have a moment to kind of scroll down to some of the messages, there's some really um, beautiful ideas. Um, and I think that was one of the intentions, one to kind of bring calm, one to bring validation, and then one to kind of spark kind of ideas um, for moving forward on how we can manage um, the day-to-day -day and really uh, pay attention to our, our physical and mental health. Um, amazing, thank you guys so much. Okay. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Okay, happy filling of your cups and happy May 7th, everybody.